there it is. Let's try that again. Did it do it that time? There we go. There we go. Thank you. I didn't realize that it hadn't done it. Um, so again, this is um, our conversation today. We're going to talk a little bit about discussions and how we can use discussion tools in D2L a little bit more effectively and in some different kinds of ways. Um, just to get us started, I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am an instructional designer in MTSU Online. And with us today uh, is Tara Perrin, who is also an instructional designer, and she will be monitoring our chat uh, so that if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, but if you have some questions, you just want to pop them into the chat. Tara is fantastic at making that happen and um, communicating with everybody through the chat. And she's really good about making sure that I stop and talk about things um, if I sail past something that people have a question about too. So please feel free to have those conversations in the chat as well. Um, and never feel afraid to interrupt me. I love to to chat about things as we go along. And I will actually be asking y'all a few questions during this. So um, I really would love it if y'all would talk when we get there. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about the discussion tool and how we can use it effectively. Um, at the end of this workshop, you should be able to create some engaging discussion activities in D2L. Hopefully you're already doing some of those. So that one shouldn't be too big of a stretch. Um, and consider the value of social engagement and learning and knowledge acquisition. Um, the social engagement part that comes with discussion is pretty important. Uh, it's, it's a great way for us to connect with our students, and it's really how our students connect with each other. Um, they don't get the, uh, those opportunities in an online class or in a, a mostly remote or hybrid class um, that you would get in a face-to-face -face class of the casual interaction. Uh, where little conversations happen about things. So um, being intentional about how we do that within our um, online and hybrid courses is really important. Um, and then the third one is feeling confident utilizing ratings and upvotes in D2L discussion tools. So we're actually going to talk about more than just that one, but that is one of the ones that um, if you were going to say at the end of this, there's one thing I want to be able to take away and I want to be able to do this one thing that's not too difficult to uh, create in my discussions, but can really create some pretty awesome opportunities for my student. That is the, the one thing that when you leave this, I want you to feel really great about being able to use those within discussions and how those can create opportunities for your students. Okay, um, we're going to talk about um, a little bit about theory and where some of the importance of discussion comes from, because you know I love me a little bit of theory and I think it's important for what we do to be grounded in something. So um, there's constructivism and constructionism and they're not actually all that different in terms of their concepts um, and they deal a lot with social engagement and the building of things um, and I use both of these a lot within my teaching and learning and within my course development. One of them is about creating artifacts together. And one of them is about the creation of knowledge and the creation of information as a result of your interactions. And I use those as the foundation of, of conversations about discussion because through our discussions is where we learn those things about each other and how their other people's knowledge and our own knowledge can impact each other. Um, and we all live in our little space. The thing that we know more of than anything in the whole world is ourselves. Um, and we're also usually really good about talking about ourselves because we're pretty confident about it. Um, like I know me, I know what I'm about. I can share that. But there are things that I know and things that I have learned in my life and opportunities and experiences that being able to share those create a different level of engagement and learning with those around us, things that I've seen, things that I've done, things that I've experienced. It really promotes diversity. It devote, it promotes inclusion. Uh, and it really creates those moments of, I read this thing and it said this to me because of my experience in my life. But you may have read the exact same thing and gotten a totally different perspective because of your background and what you know. So having those opportunities within a discussion for people to share those perspectives makes our experience a wider experience. It's a greater 
depth and breadth of experience because we get to see more than just me and you. Uh, and that's really where the whole use of, of discussions within online um, courses and things came from is about creating that opportunity for us to engage with each other, with our peers, not just student to faculty. Because even then, student to faculty is one perspective and another perspective. Now, I would think that a lot of faculty perspective is a little bit more broad than some other groups of people um, because we see so much, and we've, we've learned so much, and we've experienced so much. And part of what we do is help other people see outside of their their own lane and really start to experience more things. But the more peers that we can get people to interact with, the more they'll see, the more they'll experience, the more that they'll learn. So for me, I think looking at discussions in terms of having people work together to create things and then to create those experiences is really where it's important for discussion. And that's why I wanted to talk a little bit more about how to use discussion um, in your classes. So. Um, how do you use discussions presently in your class? Anybody? Raise your hand, interrupt, take off mute, whatever works. Um, how do you use them right now? Yeah, Elise. I use them for multiple purposes. I use them to ensure students have completed say an, a reading assignment. Okay. Uh, so for completion purposes and comprehension, uh, I use them and so I, I uh, and, and, and to gauge deeper understanding. Um, I use them to have students share their perspectives with one another. So they post and then other students respond to them. Um, I don't do as much of asking questions and getting answers. Um, similar to what Todd just put up, I usually have them, I usually do three peer responses, um, but I'm really drawn to this idea of creating artifacts together because I am not a fan of group projects in part because of the inability to discern fully who's done what work and how much. So when I do group discussion projects, it can be, there are three questions you decide amongst yourselves who's going to address, you know, so say they've, they're given outside assignments to read one more thing or screen one more movie or whatever it may be. I ask them to each to, to decide within a group of three who wants to answer which question, and then I can judge them individually. That's enough from me. Okay, no, I think those are some great, great options. How do other people use discussions? I see the chat. Um, Prompt-based discussions, student video notes. Yes, student video notes. Y'all know we love some video note. <laughs> so we're all about that. Um, students based on prompts, one response, two peer responses. Okay. Um, Sherry, did you have something to add as well? Yeah. If you, can you hear me? Yes. I'm in a weird setting, so I'm just going to keep the camera off, but I appreciate this. Uh, I'm fairly new. I came back to work on a doctoral program, mainly because I felt I needed more experience. And I'll just share this because they the institution where I was previously with the masters, we had discussion posts, but I really didn't quite like how it was handled. And I feel like your introduction was precisely what I was seeking to get through with a discussion. The, the, the engagement and participation and the way that students learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say this is because the discussion post was merely like a Dropbox. <laughs> Put in an essay, make sure your reference are, are up to date. And, and I just felt that there was a lot lost. I felt that that looked more like a, a Dropbox for an assignment or an essay, rather than everybody learning from each other, as uh, some of you mentioned earlier, the interaction and the review and right now it's different where in the class and I, I'm, I'm really happy that you all are seeing this and that are providing these materials 
and this new approach, so to speak. Like I said, I'm new, so I'm learning. You all might be doing this for years and years, and I'm just so excited to be with you, but thanks. Absolutely. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you know, that actually does kind of lead to the, for quite a while, discussions were really, um, you, you post either a list of questions or one question, and then uh, students do their initial response, and then you require two or three responses to other classmates. Um, you know, some of the early conversations that we've had about discussions, at least in the, the couple of years that I've been here, were about really thinking about your discussion prompt beyond a question and response, but more about how we can create those types of prompts that get students really thinking beyond the surface. Um, one of the examples I use is, um, it's hard to have discussion if the question is, what is globalization? It's a lot more engaging of a conversation if instead you're saying something more along the lines of within our course resources um, or utilizing the course resource description of globalization, where do you see globalization in your everyday life or in your community or in your work experience or in, um, in our, our course or other places that it allows the student to take that to a more personal uh, and authentic level where they're really kind of engaging in a way that they're making those connections to things outside of the classroom. That also just by itself gives an opportunity for classmates to learn something about each other. Um, because where I'm talking about where I see globalization in my community, um, I am talking about my community and I'm talking about myself and I'm talking about my work or I'm talking about um, family or whatever it is that I happen to be using as my example of globalization, that allows me to talk more about myself and I'm sharing myself in that. So I'm creating some of that constructivism right there, just in that initial post. And then in responses, having students communicate about what the student said uh, in terms of their personal scope of what is globalization, instead of responding to someone else's same definition. That's where discussion can get kind of tedious and feel like busy work is if everybody posted the exact same definition of globalization, what are they responding to? They all said the same thing. Um, that's, that's harder for you to grade. It makes it take a little bit longer because it, it's exhausting to read. 25 exact same discussion posts. Um, so it's a little bit harder for you and they don't feel as engaged in it. Uh, so it really is about taking it to that next level with your prompts and thinking about those prompts. In a face-to-face -face class, we can say, what is globalization? And someone will give us the definition from the resources or the readings. Um, but then in our face-to-face -face class, we actually take that discussion to the next level and we ask, where do you see this in your community? Where did you see this in these other readings? Where did you know, this come from or this thing come from? We're doing that in a very fluid manner in our face-to-face -face classes. In our online classes, we have to consciously think about that beforehand and actually put that into our prompt. Um, so that's really where some of that comes from is really early thinking about what it is that we want to do and how we want to do that. Um, so that that's kind of where that the background of really thinking about that with discussion and creating your prompts comes from um, and thinking about them more in terms of a prompt instead of a question might also kind of help think beyond here's my one question um, so it, it's just kind of a word shift but it can make a little bit of a, a little bit of a difference um, several of the other things that you know we think about with discussion is once upon a time as well, um, in terms of instruction hours and contact hours, and this is just a side note, and there are videos on the um, MTSU YouTube channel about um, using uh, instruction hours and how we measure instruction hours, so y'all are welcome to go check those out, um, but within that once upon a time, it was actually contact hours, not just instruction hours. Uh, and it was harder in the early times of online to understand how to measure those hours. So discussions seemed like the one and only way to get there. Um, and things have advanced a lot from that. So it used to be a, a discussion was required in every week um, or every 
chapter. And now it's more about being very intentional about when we use discussions uh, and how we use discussions to create those peer interactions. Um, instead of every week, are we just doing it every week because that's what we're used to? Are we doing it every week because that is the best way for us to have those ongoing conversations with our students? So really kind of thinking about how we're using the tool kind of makes a difference a little bit too. Um, one of the things that Elise brought up is actually uh, earlier is one of the ones that we really do actually want to talk about, um, and that's utilizing groups. So we'll actually talk about that one in, in a second. Um, but I first want to go ahead and talk about ratings and upvotes. Um, some of you that have worked with some of the instructional designers probably have used um, ratings and upvotes a lot. Um, and uh, because we have started bringing them in to uh, more and more of our conversations. So I'm going to um, take us to take a look at what, oh, look, I can't spell discussions. Y'all don't tell anybody in the English department that I can't spell discussion. <laughs> Um, so we're going to look a little bit at, can y'all see my shared screen still? Is it sharing? The, okay. Um, so I'm going to show y'all some examples of ratings and, and upvotes and talk a little bit about what those look like. So when you are creating your discussion and you've got hey, all Kim, these, yes, I'm sorry to disturb you. Can you make it a little bigger while we can see it? It's not, not it's very not big. Me. How about that? Is that a little bit uh, better? Yes, that's definitely better. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'll make it one bigger. Um, so when you're creating discussions and you're looking at all of those options on your forum and topic page, you probably have gotten in the habit of clicking the one that says must uh, post a thread first, or um, you may have some options that you allow for it to be anonymous, but you may not pay attention to a whole lot of the other things that happen on that front page because you've probably been building these for a little while. Um, so I'm gonna show you where that ratings and upvote is. And then I'm gonna actually show you what those look like and give you a couple of different types of opportunities and ways that we talk about uh, using those within your class. So um, within discussions, uh, when you are in your discussion, you're in your discussion forum, um, and feel free, as always, to minimize me. If you want to create a discussion, you can minimize this conversation and open your D2L and walk through it with me. Um, I'm more than happy to not be the center of attention while you're figuring out how to do this. So um, here we are. We are in a forum. Uh, and I'm going to help y'all create a topic. Um, so oops, I'm in a topic, not a forum. Just kidding. Um, so I am in. Um, when you go into discussions, and we're here in, in our course discussions, I'm going to use the one that is example for discussion presentation, and I'm going to add a topic. Um, so we just click the little carrot, we add a topic. And this is our new topic. And this is our um, example. And all you're doing, you probably are really used to looking at these, you have these tabs where your dates are. We're going to talk about those in a little bit. Y'all don't let me forget because they've changed and it's important to know. Um, we've restrictions. This is where your dates and other restrictions are. Assessments is where you tie it to your grades. We can at some point talk about objectives, but that is a whole nother LT and ITC presentation, Sheila. Um, we'll put our little bit of description in here. This is where you would put the sentences in your prompt about what you want them to do. My guess is about this point is where y'all are like, okay, I've put in my description and you don't really go down and look at a lot of the other boxes that are below it. Well, this is where the options to allow anonymous posts exist. So if you actually wanted something that you allowed anonymous posts, um, I tend to turn that on for my ask the class uh, discussion board that I have in case somebody doesn't feel comfortable having their name tied to the question they're asking. That is an option for you. I almost always turn on the user must start a thread before they can read and reply so that there's some diversity in post and everybody's doesn't look like the first person. Um, I will tell you in my heart of hearts that I never do the one that is moderator because it means you have to read everyone's post before it can be posted. Uh, and that takes a lifetime. So, um, and really takes away from your ability to really engage with your students in the discussion board. Uh, if you have concerns 
ab about how people are communicating and that is the reason that you're putting that there, then we should probably give you some, some word prompts and examples that we have that might help you better hold your students accountable for their communication style in a digital platform. We have some stuff that we can give you if you're having some problems with that. Um, but typically it's that um, some expectation on how they communicate with each other and holding them accountable if they don't. Um, instead of you having to monitor everything, give them that ownership of, of their own behavior. And if they don't do what they're supposed to do, then hold them accountable for that. Um, so I don't click the monitor one, but this is where rate the posts are. Uh, so there's this cute little drop down here at the bottom of the page that says rate post, and it is standard set to no rating. But when you click on that, you have a five star rating, you have a vote up down rating system, and you have a vote up rating system. I'm going to show you all the five star and the vote up rating system. Um, I tend not to do the vote up and down. Um, if you don't get an upvote, you already know you weren't the best. Um, do we really need to give you a downvote and make you feel like even less successful? So I tend to leave the downvote out unless it is um, a topic that I have posted and I am asking for my students to give me feedback. Um, do y'all want to change the way that this is structured or how's this going for you? Or if I'm asking for their feedback and opinion through the course, through our own course discussion boards where they communicate with me, I will use the up down, but I'm the only person that they're up downing. Um, I don't want them to downvote each other. So um, that's just me and my own personal way of using it. So um, if we were gonna use the five-star rating system, we would simply click that and then hit save and close. And we now have our new discussion topic. Now this one is an empty discussion topic. So I, I'm not gonna um, go back into it to show you much about it because I actually created some earlier so that you could see what they look like when they're created. Um, so for the ratings one, uh, when I think about ratings ones, typically speaking, um, what I think about when I think about the ratings ones are giving them a chance to go in and gauge each other's work and presentation. Um, I tend to think of things like um, uh, infograph or um, an image or a YouTube video maybe that they found. Uh, or a presentation of their own that they created, depending on what your course is, it, it's going to lend itself to the type of activity that you use for ratings. And in my classes where I use ratings, I actually have very specific instructions, which if y'all would like those, uh, we have some sample ones that we can have um, send out after the presentation's over that we can kind of put together a little folder of things for y'all um, and send it to you. So if that's something you would like, let us know in the chat uh, and we'll make sure that that gets added to the information that gets sent out from the LT and ITC. And that's just examples of, of what those, uh, what the five stars might mean, um, what you might use them for, how students might use the rating for things. Um, typically for me also, if I use the ones that are ratings, whoever gets the most stars usually gets a little something. Um, for me, that might be one bonus point or um, I post a big congratulations to them as an announcement to the whole class. Um, it's not something huge. It's just something like a hey, great job, just a little bit of motivation theory that they get to, to jump in on because they get kind of a reward in front of everyone. Um, so I'm going to click on this one and let y'all see what they look like when students are going in and rating them. So I put in um, a few posts, um, and here's, look, a little rubric. Um, I put in a few posts. Um, as you will see them, um, here is an infographic. Uh, about Zoom, so I put that one in there. Um, and then, let me get my right place. Um, there's one about Zoom. And then I put in, um, I hate when I do that and it jumps way up. Um, and then I put in another example. This one was about the Addy model. 
Um, and then this one is the one that got four stars. Someone actually rated this one four stars. Now I actually know because I know who has access to my class. Um, but you can actually see where there was one rating and this one was given four stars and the other ones don't have any ratings. So I know that this is their favorite. And I'll actually show you all this one because today is Thursday and I joke a little bit about Thursday being TPT. Um, so y'all can just, cause it's Thursday. There you go. No judgment. I don't actually throat punch people. It just makes us laugh a little bit. Um, so that is the one that got some upvotes for me. So they got a four star rating. Um, that one got the rating. So right now that one's winning. So if other people were in here, they could come in and they could vote and maybe they like the Addy model better or maybe they like the Zoom presentation better. Obviously, they're not going to be that diverse within your own discussion board because it's going to be about something that y'all are doing um, and it's really an awesome way to get students to be a little bit more engaging now here is the way that i think is important to talk about how our students engage with those um, you'll see that this one was only one person has been in this class to view um, but that person viewed all three all three have been viewed by that individual but that individual didn't have to go in and read a 500 word essay post um, for however many people they engaged with every single discussion post from that was in this forum. They every single one they went in and they looked at it and then they had to review it and make a decision about what they wanted to rate it. So for me, the way that I usually do this is that I tell the students to go in and view and look at them, review the ones that are in there, and then vote vote for them. Sometimes, I, depending on how big the class is, I may have them vote for all of them. I may have them vote for three or four. Um, and I do the same thing with the upvote on this too, but um, I may have them ranked three or four. And when they have a ranking of a five or um, when they go in and do a ranking, I actually have them respond why they gave that ranking. Um, and I do that because it has the student kind of go in and, and give like a one sentence response. But if I have 10 or 15 people in my class and the student is going in and they're looking at every one of them and they're ranking every one of them and then writing one or two sentence response, that's not a huge response on their part. Um, and it's not even a lot that I have to go back in and read what they responded to the greatest level as I would if it was a a two or 300 word response, but they're going in and engaging with all 15. How often when we are posting a 500 word initial post and a 200 word um, response post, how often are they going in and engaging with all 15? Typically they're going in and picking two or three because we said pick two or three and they read those two or three and they respond to those two or three and then they don't ever go back and look at it again. But if they can go in and it's one that they can go and look over what that person said, review what that person said um, or posted or put in there and then give that ranking and list a one or two sentence response, they're actually getting a ton of engagement with their classmates because they're reviewing everybody's. They're seeing everybody's perspective, not just those two other people that we required within the post. So it actually expands the amount of engagement and there's some accidental learning that happens um, by viewing other people's infographs or videos or their posts or um, you know, if they wrote a poem and you want them to post the poem and share it, they can actually go in and upvote or rate each other's poems and then talk about why they gave it that rating. Um, so that's what the rating looks like. Does anybody have any questions about the ratings one before I show you what upvote looks like? Okay. I actually do. Sure. So my question is, yes. Is there potential? I think there's potential for this and it worries me. Um, once in a while, I will have a student who will get the response does not answer the question. It does not address the prompt accurately. So it shows some level of misunderstanding that let's say relates to having read the prompt too quickly or something like that. 
Mm -hmm. but their fellow students love it. Like I say, discuss one of the minor characters and they discuss the protagonist Mm -hmm. and the students love it. And they all give it five stars. And the students said, why did I not get full points when I was clearly wrote the best response? Um, address that clearly in your rubric that the rating is not necessarily where your grade comes from. Um, As long as your rubric is really clear. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Great. That's what I do. Um, I do it more for, it's just an opportunity for y'all to view each other's and engage. Um, And then the the rubric response that people get, the points they might get in the rubric for the rating is is not the highest. It's about the overall initial creation. Um, and that's just a way for them to engage with each other and get some points for it. But they tend to really get into it. Um, so at least from my experiences. Any other questions about ratings before we take a look at the next one? Um, so the next one I wanted to show you is the upvote, uh, and it works a lot the same way. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, I, I tend to use it in pretty much the same way. I tend to address it in pretty much the same way of, um, go in and vote for your three favorite, uh, and then discuss why, or go in and vote, go through and review them all. It just kind of depends on the size of your class. If you, if you are teaching a, a graduate level class that has six people in it, you're going to have a slightly different course engagement than if you have 50 in a class. And I hope you don't have 50 in your online class because that's a lot. Though I can tell you that they'll engage with more if you have a ton of people in your class and you have things that they really feel like they can go in and don't feel overwhelmed. It does help. Um, So you'll see over on the left-hand side where there are little zeros and little ones. Um, And this is where... Um, It was still Thursday, so another image was posted here, Um, and then there were two others that were posted, and these are embedded YouTube videos um, that um, I put in there as the discussion post using the insert stuff. Uh, So these are just videos. So these are the two that were upvoted. Um, One is the shoebox from MTSU Homecoming. This is me saying it was not the MTSU Online Instructional Designers that misspelled burying in the video. Um, we know how to spell that. Um, I can't spell discussion clearly, but I can spell burying. Um, and then the other one that got an upvote was, um, at the thriller video. Um, you know, just in case we need a little celebration of Halloween. Um, so that's what those look like is it causes this little one over here in this column. Um, and it, when you're viewing it as a student, students can see those star ratings and those upvotes as well. They know how somebody's doing um, and they know what's going on with that um, in terms of people that are getting voted. Um, so, you know, maybe they go in and vote for somebody who hasn't gotten one yet uh, or gives them a chance to really go in and promote the ones that they think are different or cool. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the upvote? since it's very similar in how it's structured, it's just the choice as to whether or not you want it to be an upvote or a rating. Okay. I have one quick question, if I may. Sure. Just out of curiosity, are students allowed to vote more than once? Since you're mentioning, maybe they want to go back and promote a student's point of view or whatever. Are they allowed to vote more than once? You can vote as for as many different threads as you want, um, but you can only vote for that thread one time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, Todd. So um, I have students who have anxiety issues, and if they received no upvotes or no stars, um, that they're going to react negatively to that. Um, Do you have any strategies for how to deal with that? Make sure everybody, so that you got a couple options. Um, You can, in in your information, um, you can uh, have them make sure they vote for for every, it's harder with a vote because you're not going to, everybody's not going to get an upvote. Um, But with stars that, um, that they need to vote for, they need to go in and assess everyone or they need to go and assess ones that people haven't already done. Um, 
and I typically address it in the, when you get in there, if there are any that don't have any, those are the ones that you need to start with. Um, so that there's really more, otherwise it ends up being whoever the first person that was, everybody goes in and votes for that one because it was the first one. Um, so I do try to express to them that they need to go in and look at ones that don't already have um, star ratings and then give them those star ratings. Um, and then it helps some too with um, the thing that I see a lot of you have asked for um, some examples of those things. So we'll definitely send you those, but it does help if you have some of those uh, resources that you're like, this is what a five star is, or this is what a three star is so that people can really feel more confident about actually giving those stars and what those stars look like. Um, and then within that too, helping the student understand that it's a student rating based on first impression. Um, it's not actually your grade. Um, and so that tends to have a little bit more impact in that. And that is part of why I don't use the down vote because I really don't want a student to go in and give another student a down vote because that can really kind of crush some confidence on that one. And be selective about what type of, of resources and activities you assign the ratings to um, so that students know. And they tend to figure it out if you use it more than once in a class, they figure out a little bit more about how they work and what it's like and things like that. And they start to really kind of get engaged with them in a different way. I hope that helps some. Okay. Can you also okay. provide some examples of when upvoting is most helpful? Oh, absolutely. So for me, one of the times that I think upvoting is really helpful um, is when I'm having them go out and look for a resource, um, something that's a current event application of the thing that we were talking about, or a, a resource that they found on a particularly confusing or um, more difficult topic to grab hold of, and a resource that they go find on the internet um, or um, within the library or wherever it is that that I have them go look for it, that is the thing that connected for them and that concept. Um, so, you know, say they really don't have a great grasp, they're having a hard time really grasping um, what is homecoming. And so in order to understand homecoming, they're going out and looking at resources on the internet about what is that concept and they find a video or they find a web page or something that really makes the concept connect in their mind, they share it. And then they talk about why it connected or why they chose that one. Um, and then with the upvotes, I tend to actually have people go through and take a look and see which of those resources helped them make that connection with that concept or um, really make something resonate with them so that they're not only are your are your students going out and finding these resources that they're bringing in obviously it would be something slightly more meaningful and deep than homecoming um, but they're going out and finding these resources that are making things connect with them and then they are also going out and reviewing each other so that that maybe they're connecting with things that that they didn't even really think were all that important at first thought or that it helped them see it in a perspective that maybe they didn't see. And so being able to upvote that, oh, this one really made me think about this concept that I hadn't even really thought about before, or it really took it in a new direction that I hadn't thought about before. Um, they also work really great if you're using them. Um, if you have um, an exam, review or something like that and students are kind of struggling with some of those concepts having them after they kind of look at a review or some h5p flashcards or something like that if there's something that they were really kind of stuck on using that as the concept that they go out and find a resource that made sense to them and then post it and explain why they posted that item that really also creates a great opportunity for an upvote because students get to be like oh my gosh I didn't even think about this thing that is super important for our learning down the road. Does that help a little bit? Does that make a little bit of sense? I can probably come up with some specific examples too. When we send out some resources, I'll try to come up with some good specific examples for y'all. Um, any other questions about Upvote before we move on to the next? Okay. Um, so the next one that we wanted to talk about a little bit um, actually, uh, refers to what um, Elise was talking about in terms of groups um, and things like that. So I wanted to show you 
um, it's kind of, it's a twofer on this one. You get two, I created two different ones for people to kind of look at um, and we'll discuss them both pretty quickly um, so that y'all can see because they kind of feed off of each other a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the things that Elise mentioned was that she provides things and then there's three questions and each one gets to, to pick which question they answer or how they answer it based on the group setting. Um, so that is definitely one way to engage people in a group, but another way that you can do it and that it kind of creates the opportunity for them to build an artifact is making sure that you create an opportunity for them to peer evaluate within their group. Um, and so one of the ways that you can do that is by actually making a peer evaluation part of the overall assignment. Um, and you can either do that through a discussion board or externally through a Dropbox. And we have some pretty cool um, things that we can send y'all on that too, if y'all want it. Um, but that is one of the ways that, that I do that within my groups is that I actually have them peer evaluate. Um, but the other way that we do that within groups is, in, and I'm showing you this, this is actually one from one of my classes that I teach. It's a instructional design and online learning class. Um, and it is that they read the book, Small Teaching Online, and had book groups within discussion boards um, so that um, the class was broken up into smaller groups. And then they actually had a book group uh, and they discussed the concepts and topics within the book with each other. In order for something like that to happen, you have to be very specific about their roles. Um, so when you're creating those group activities or even a full on course debate, which you can do, um, it's just about knowing how you want those things structured. You may do those in your face-to-face -face class. We, we know how to help you structure those things in your online classes or your remote or hybrid classes. And it's about how you use D2L to do it. And a lot of it has to do with groups and a lot of it has to do with setting up multiple discussion boards, but you can do it. It's just very specific in the roles that you set up and your instructions. Um, so I'm gonna click on this and let you see what the group roles looks like um, so that you kind of have an idea of what it's gonna open on a different screen, I bet. Um, if it opens, I'll let you see it. Um, it um, it's very specific as to the roles that they play. And by doing that, you give actual um, expectations and then you know how to grade them on it because somebody had to be the moderator and somebody had to be the responder and somebody had to be the summarizer or reporter. Um, and you can obviously change your roles based on the need of your class or um, based on the level of your class. You're going to have different roles for a 1000 level class than you are a 7000 level doctoral class. That's, that's just how that's going to be because of the use of and and ways of engaging with the the material um but having those very specific roles is super duper helpful for your students and for your grading later but it really gives a chance for them to to be in that space and run their own discussion and their own class discussion and they have to engage with each other and learn from each other. The same with debates or if you have role play scenarios or case studies, giving them specific duties to have um, within that, within the discussion board is really where that happens. And you do those probably in your face-to-face -face class, but you can do them online just as well. And I get a ton of great feedback from students about these different uses of discussion boards because they feel like it, it kind of makes the information have a, a different level of purpose and connection. Um, so it really helps them also engage. And even the ones where um, I've had the groups present, like they've created actual presentations, like that they video themselves doing a presentation as a completely asynchronous online group and then they get to present that to the class. And then the class goes in and reviews those presentations and then engages with those presentations in the way of asking a different additional questions, um, giving some feedback, making connections between whatever was their presentation was and the one that they viewed and really creating those opportunities for that extra level. 
And I see your hand, Anne. What's up? What can I help with? Um, I've considered using groups. As you know, I teach five big survey classes. Mm -hmm. um, and discussions are so difficult to manage. So I've thought about breaking up into groups. But how would, when you're talking about a survey level class, 30 kids, you don't really know going into it what level any of them are at. So how do you break up a class that big into effective groups? Because having been one of the students that carried the group work from first grade to grad school, <laughs> that don't want to put the strong students in the position where they're doing all of the work and giving, for lack of a better word, the lazy students an easy way out. So, so how do you determine how to break up your classes into groups? Uh, some of that depends on what you're using it for. So group projects, um, I mean, that I either let them self-select um, or, uh, well, and then I also use a student evaluation rubric that I have that's that peer evaluation that they rate each other. And it's a substantial part of their grade. Um, so that if they don't participate, their classmates tell you and it impacts their overall grade. Um, which helps. I've, I've seen that help. If it's something more in terms of um, a, a module comprehension kind of discussion board group, uh, then you probably are good with um, having larger groups of 10 or even 15. 30 is too many to manage in a discussion, a full discussion board. Um, it's too many to manage for your students. It's too many to manage for you. But 10 or 15, they can communicate with each other pretty well. And you can kind of keep an eye on what's going on. And it's easier for you to engage with them because it's, it's three, two or three separate discussions instead of 30. Um, so having that type of of discussion board breakdown helps too. So it kind of depends on are you, are you thinking about in terms of a comprehension type discussion board where you might use the ratings or the upvotes or things like that to help them engage, or are you thinking more like a small group project? I guess that's, it really kind of depends on what you're using it for. I know right. that's not um, if, a helpful if you, answer. <laughs> if you could send the student evaluation rubric out, that would be great. Sure. I can definitely do that. We have all kinds of fun stuff. We'll send anybody that needs it. Um, what other kinds of questions do y'all have? We have a question about assessment. Can you talk about assessment a little bit? Because we only have five minutes left. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> and then I got to show y'all the, the date thing that changed too, or I'm going to get in trouble with Tara. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that was mentioned. And then also too, just so everyone knows, we will. I have all of your requests that were in the chat. I've saved them. So we'll make sure that we get the, the right information to everyone after the conclusion of the workshop. Yes. Um, so in, in terms of assessment, um, without knowing for sure, I'm sure it's somewhere in the, um, the chat, but for assessment, for me, what is so helpful and important with any of uh, the, the outside of the norm um, structures within discussion um, or any kind of activity and assessment is using the D2L rubrics tool. Um, and I create my rubric pretty much at the same time that I am creating my assessment. Um, I may not create it in D2L. I, I, I follow all the great instructional design brainwave powers and I create all of my stuff outside of D2L and then give it to my instructional designer to help me develop my class within D2L. Ironically, however, I'm my own instructional designer, so it doesn't really help me a lot. I still do all the work. Um, so it doesn't save me any time, um, but I develop everything outside so that while I'm thinking about what my assessment's going to look like, I know exactly how I'm going to grade it. Um, and so for me, that's where it's really the most important is the more information that I give my students up front about assessing their activities, the actual easier it is for me to assess it later, because I know what I'm looking for. They know what I'm looking for. And if I put it in the D2L rubrics, then it's actually pretty quick because those are, um, they're a slide. It's an active hot button rubric. So you just click and then you can add your feedback based on what you said you were going to be looking for. Um, and it actually, for me, at least it gives me a greater opportunity to be able to have the very purposeful and meaningful individual 
assessment of activities if I'm using those rubrics because I'm not looking for things like I'm not spending my time on um, you didn't follow the instructions of how to create the section of the infograph that is given you got a zero or you got a one um, because you didn't use the basic layout information that you were given I'm not having to spend my time on that instead I can spend my time having those conversations of hey, thinking about this topic, let's talk about where we can go further with this or have you thought about this direction because the rubric makes that easier for me because it's so automatic with you didn't use grammar or you didn't, you can't use blinking text or whatever it is that um, are the thing. I didn't have to type that because I just clicked the button. Um, but I think that's really, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what y'all were asking about in terms of assessment, but I think that that's the biggest thing if I can give you any advice on using new and different ways of using discussion boards is to really consciously think about how you want each of those components to be assessed at the end as you're creating it. Um, and those are things too that we can help y'all with. Um, so if you have questions about that, we either may already have that rubric or that resource, um, or we can definitely talk through it with you and have some of those talk to me about what it is that you're looking for. What is the most important thing in this activity to you? What is it that you want them to walk away with? Um, and that's really where that comes from is what is the greatest, the greatest value within that? I hope that answered that question. Yes, it did. Okay. <laughs> um, and then really fast, I'm going to show y'all how to um, do um, the date thing, because it's like two o'clock right now, but there's a thing that changed within restrictions. And I said earlier, I was going to tell you about it. So within restrictions for discussions, there used to be um, a little option here that was the availability and then the lock unlock. I don't know if you have noticed that there is no longer the lock unlock. Um, and that is super duper important. It is auto set. When you go in to set your end date, the auto set is visible with access restricted after end, which means they cannot see it. Not only can they not post to it, they can't see it anymore. So if you want your students to not be able to post to it anymore, but you still want them to be able to see it, then you're going to want to click on the one that says visible with submission restricted, because that means they can still see it but they can't keep posting. So you won't have people posting four and five weeks later, but they can actually still go back and look at it. Um, so if there's, especially if there's something you want to reference later in the semester, it probably really helps to have that so they can go back and see it. They just can't keep posting. And don't forget to always click the display and calendar. So it pops up in D2L and gives them the notification that they have an assignment coming up. Uh, and it is two o'clock. Um, so we're here. I'm not going anywhere. So if anybody wants to stay and ask questions or has any uh, additional things that y'all would like to know, uh, we'll stay for a little bit, but please don't feel like you have to if you have somewhere else that you need to be. Um, or if you have additional questions and you can't stay, please feel free to reach out to Tara or I or Karen, uh, and we are happy to help you out. But that's really the end of the presentation anyway. So um, I'm going to stop my screen share and we'll turn off the record as well. Um, and then if people have additional questions, we're still here. Thank you all for coming. Hey, 